good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have three representatives from the National Park Service here today to talk about the role of the Park Service in metropolitan communities. And those three individuals all represent units of the National Park Service that are here in the greater Chicago metropolitan area. Uh, we have Indiana Dunes National Park, which has recently changed designation from a national lakeshore to a national park. Uh, just down the road in northern Indiana. Uh, we have Sue Bennett from Pullman National Monument, which is a unit of the National Park Service, the same way as a National Lakeshore or a National Historic Park. Um, and that is located on the south side in the Pullman neighborhood. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about something different. It's going to be a program of the National Park Service called Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance. So uh, we're going to start by giving a brief overview of what our park or program is. and how we interact with the places we call home, and then we're going to have uh, some questions and answers. So we'll start off with Superintendent Paul Lavis from Indiana Dunes National Park. Would you like to answer this to the... Right. Okay, I'll do this one. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's nice to be in Chicago. I just, uh, I was in New Buffalo, Michigan last night talking about fish in the Great Lakes, and now I am in Chicago talking about cities like 12 hours later or 15 hours later or whatever the time is. And it's kind of a time warp. If you've been to New Buffalo, a sleepy little lake town, and here I am in the third largest city in the country. So it's great to be here. And so if I slip into a fish conversation, please forgive me. <laughs> um, I'm getting old and dottery. So uh, I've been with the National Park Service for 31 years. And uh, I'm a, I, I grew up in Philadelphia. I'm an inner city kid. I'm that inner city kid with no connection to nature that you hear a lot about. And um, somebody, when I was about nine, took me fishing. And I thought, hey, this is kind of cool. And then uh, when I was about 11, my mother took me for a hike in New Jersey and I caught a lizard. And I said, hey, this is kind of cool. And I told my father I wanted to go to school to be a forester. My father was the city slicker. And he's like, what in God's name are you going to do with your life? Count squirrels in Fairmount Park? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to work outside. And as you can tell you, the further up you go, the less outside you go. But I've done some cool stuff. And, and, and my uh, first job out of school was with a private landowner where I managed a 10,000 acre property in western Pennsylvania for timber and wildlife and we had a little coal mine, some ag operations, a more traditional um, resource driven uh, commercial operation and now I'm with the National Park Service which is a different side of the business but somebody suggested to me in about 1986 they said you should think about working for the National Park Service and I said at that moment I will never work for the National Park Service just like that and here I am 31 years in the National Park Service and uh, loving it I've been really fortunate to have worked in uh, on projects in the rivers and trails program in about 30 states in my career and I've uh, done even some national park and conservation work in Central Europe over the last 25 years and uh, most days I wake up saying I can't believe that they pay me for this but on that I, my National Park Service career has not been one the deputy superintendent at Indiana Dunes has worked at Yosemite and the Grand Canyon and in Alaska and I have not I've worked in uh, the urban parks, as they're called, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, Independence National Historic Park, Mississippi National River and Recreation Area in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and now Indiana Dunes with the view of Chicago from our beaches. And I used to I used to wrestle with that because I you know I always dreamed I'd work in Montana. Right? So how many people dream about working for the National Park Service in Indiana? Think about that. Well, it's the people who haven't been to Indiana Dunes. And Sue will tell you, she worked over there. So um, I, I, my first few years, I talked about wanting to go to the big Western traditional parks and uh, it never worked out. I even had my kids with Montana sweatshirts when somebody from the DC office came to visit once. <laughs> I lived in Ohio, uh, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. I, we lived in Akron, Ohio, and the park was between Cleveland and Akron. It's a great place if you've never been there. But so we have this uh, thing about urban national parks parks near cities. And we even hear things from uh, well-intentioned well, -to -do, well -intentioned people who believe that 
You can't be a real national park unless you're a million acres and you're far away from everybody. So how many of you here have been to Yellowstone? A couple of ringers. I see Colin back there. He's a ringer. Slightly less than half of you. How many here have been to Indiana Dunes National Park? Yeah, I guess why is that? Because it's what, 35 minutes away? So I was in Yellowstone two weeks ago in Grand Tetons. I had a meeting in Grand Teton. Now this is the scam about government. I get to go to the Grand Tetons to go work and have a meeting. Right, can't be better than that. And I was completely blown away by the scenery, but what I was also blown away by was the um, complete difference in the kind of people who were visiting Grand Teton National Park. In fact, a lot of them were not Americans, they were foreigners who had spent a lot of money to go to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Indiana Dunes is the kind of national park you can go to for lunch on a whim. You cannot do that at Yellowstone. You can't do that, I'm sorry. And so, and I'm not saying Yellowstone's a bad place, Yellowstone's a spectacular place. It's a spectacular place. And the national park system is 419 sites. Mike sort of dabbled in the names. National Park, National Lakeshore, National Seashore, National Battlefield, National Recreation Area, National River, National Monument. Blah, 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 blah. It's so confusing to the public, most folks don't care. And when you work at one of those places with a long name, like Mississippi <coughs> National River and Recreation Area, oh, you mean the National Park? Yes, that's what we mean. And we have done a great job for 103 years now confusing people about what that means. They're all the same. They're all the best examples of the nation's natural and cultural heritage. The names are uh, incidental. And in fact, it's a political process that arrives at the name. And I won't say anything more about why that's a disaster. I'll let you infer. So here we got the city kid from Philly. He's been a career working around the United States and other parts of the world on uh, national park and protected areas and has spent a career in what are considered urban national parks and loving it. So internally to the National Park Service, the Park Service says we need to be more relevant to all Americans. We need to serve a more diverse audience. We need to this, we need to that. And the only parks that can actually do that and have been doing that routinely for decades are the parks that are actually located close to where most people live. So all the things that Yellowstone wants to do Indiana Dunes National Park has been doing for 53 years because we're nestled in a metropolitan area with a diverse population. So we don't have those problems with our visitation, uh, which in most national parks is a fairly um, homogenous collection of wealthy, well-educated white people. And so as the country's makeup changes, that demographic is becoming less and less, and so the Park Service struggles with people just don't, not having a tradition of going to those places. We don't have that in Indiana Dunes. We, uh, we have facilities uh, from Michigan City to Gary, and routinely you come to the park and you see all kinds of different people doing all kinds of different fun things. And you don't see that at Yellowstone. And I can tell you that because I was there a week and a half ago. And I've been there a half a dozen times and the, the view never changes. Um, so that said, uh, I'm excited to be a part of this. I'm excited to share with you Indiana Dunes National Park. You know, when people come over there, it's a weird place, right? 15,000 acres, 50 miles of trail, great park rangers. Um, one of the most ecologically biodiverse places in North America. And how do, you, how do you come to grips with a place that has that kind of biodiversity that surrounds some of the largest industry in America, surrounds the port of Indiana, the largest, busiest port on the Great Lakes, and you can see the third largest city in the country from its beaches? How is that kind of biodiversity still intact after this long? <coughs> and that's why Indiana Dunes National Park was talked about as one of the first national parks in 1916 by the first director of the National Park Service, Stephen Mather, who was a Chicago businessman. A lot of folks have forgotten that. So I'm gonna, I think I'm wrapped up for now. I, I probably went over my time. Did I go over my time? Okay. Park superintendents are allowed to go over my time. <laughs> so thank you, and we'll look forward to answering some questions.
<laughs> and my colleague Sue Bennett from Pullman National Monument, another great national park site. Paul says, colleague, he used to be my superintendent because I did come from Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore. Um, I never dreamed I would be a park ranger in a uniform with my flat hat walking the streets of Chicago. I am a <laughs> Illinoisan, I'm a Chicago suburbanite. Um, worked a little bit at the Morton Arboretum and the Field Museum and uh, applied for a summer job. I only wanted to go to one park. I'd been there for business the year before. That was Mount Rainier. I actually saw the mountain that day and uh, sent in an application and they said come. So I took my bike apart and loaded it on Amtrak and rode the Empire Builder out there and was stuck on the mountain for the whole summer uh, being a park ranger and it changed my life. And so I've spent 30 years since that time um, knocking around the park system all over the country in a variety of places, some wilderness, some suburban, some urban, and uh, hoping to spark and ignite that passion um, that I found in my first national park, helping to connect people, um, find their own passion and, and meaning for the places. So uh, it's a delight to be full circle and come back to become an Illinois resident and actually to be working in Pullman National Monument in South Chicago. We knew when the park was being created that the Indiana Dunes would provide some support and maybe be sort of a, a parent park for a little bit. And uh, they lured me over. I'm not a labor historian, um, but that's okay. The ideas that that park talks about are super exciting. You know, it is an urban park. It's actually in Cook County, but when it was uh, envisioned about 140 years ago, uh, by a guy, it was not an urban park. <laughs> it was outside of the city limits specifically, strategically, because it was going to be more financially uh, uh, beneficial for them, um, buy property easier, and also um, avoid some of the city taxes. <laughs> so some stories just never change 140 years later. What was there was a blank prairie, and it was the dream of a gentleman. And I have a little bit of a devilish delight in thinking about George Mortimer Pullman. He had the vision to create his own train car manufacturing, make a town for his workers and run that town, and also um, provide uh, rental train cars across America with outstanding, excellent onboard service. And so those were sort of the four spinning plates. At the time, it wasn't a brand new idea, but many things about George Pullman he took and did better. And so for a while, he was sort of doing what Kappa sort of does. You know, they're evaluating what makes a great city, what makes a great community. How can we improve the quality of life for the workforce and also for the lives of the people there? And that's what George Pullman's vision was. The one difference between what this institute does and George Pullman is he wanted to make money. So there was that one capitalist <laughs> spinning wheel that is a little bit different than um, what uh, UIC is doing with their programming. Uh, but still, uh, you know, it, it, he got a lot of hard knocks because of that, um, and we had a big labor strike because of that. Um, and it was really the first time in America that uh, four forces came together that we still talk about today, and that was the force of capitalism or an entrepreneur. We often love entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I can name a few like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. Um, until suddenly, like Amazon, they get too big and we begin to think, wait, whoa, you know, maybe this capitalism is ahead. Maybe there are some issues with the workers there, that they're behind the scenes. There are some um, issues with gender, race, equality, opportunity, safety, health, hours, age. Um, I'm talking about 140 years ago or maybe 125 years ago, not today. They were talking back in the past. But George Pullman felt, uh, just like his train cars, if I make a better train car, it's more comfortable, people will pay for that extra service. He transferred that idea to the town of Pullman. If I make a town and a manufacturing, new, clean, efficient, and I have a variety of housing price points, my workers will come. They'll be happy to work there. They'll be happy to pay you a variety of prices, and um, I will help them help themselves raise them up and I will make money for myself and my investors. So I always have to add that into that equation. It's a little bit different. So 140 years ago, this place was put on the landscape. We talk a lot about um, labor relations from the 1894 strike, but also worker rights and that sort of dance between workers, capitalists, 
um, government regulators, state regulators, city regulators, and then there's the media that is out there commenting on all of those things. So 140 years later, uh, what is lasting? Um, what's the part of the community that is still around? Well, that lovely clock tower is still there. And so the National Park was created. It's an unusual model for national parks. It's a more contemporary idea for the national parks and the federal government. It's a partnership park. So the only federal ownership we have is this clock tower building with the blue box around it. Um, it's about uh, 0.24 acres out of about 200 plus acres uh, of National Monument boundary. So the only thing I really get to put my fingerprints on is this building directly, but the park staff there will get to influence and collaborate with the community members. Uh, Tom Shepard, one of our community members is here. We do great programming. We just uh, celebrated the Underground Railroad dedication of the Tom Farm. So that's just one illustrated example of how um, you know private, nonprofit, community, federal government can come together. So. Uh, as we build this place out, we're just taking over the first floor. We have funding for that. It's primarily a private donation, um, a little bit of state funding and a little bit of federal funding. We're in collaboration, a partnership with Illinois Department of Natural Resources. They own the rest of the landscape there and that long building attached to that tall clock tower. Um, we work closely with them. They also manage and own Hotel Florence. There's two nonprofits that are also operating in the National Monument, the Historic Pullman Foundation. They were there first about four years ago. And then another group, the National A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porter Museum, they've been on the scene for about 26 years. And so between the four visitor destinations, plus more to come, we hope to be able to anchor this from this clock tower building. It should be open, we're hoping, uh, early 2020. The contract for the building is out on the streets today, if you know anybody that uh, wants to do a federal bid project. The state is working hard to um, get the grounds um, up to speed and do some remediation there so that we can uh, have the fence peeled back and finally allow public access to this wonderful site. So just a little bit about what is an urban park, what can the National Park Service do? Some of the same things we do absolutely everywhere. Visitor services, information, orientation, greet people locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, participate in programs and special events and education. That's sort of our bread and butter um, that is anchored at all of the units of the <coughs> National Park Service. Um, for this particular park, we also hope to be a gateway. Many urban parks and many urban green spaces are the very first time folks like Paul and folks like me, cities <coughs> and suburban kids, get a chance to be in a space different um, than what they grew up in, to get some green space, to get some wildlife, to get some open sky, uh, to get some um, uh, historic buildings, older buildings. And so we hope that by being here as an anchor in the city of Chicago, we can reflect people's passion when they come to us and open the door to the other 418 units of the National Park Service and help them figure out that they're for them as well, they're for you as well. And so we hope to reflect those kinds of values. Um, definitely engaged with youth. Um, youth are the future. Uh, let them know that this is their inheritance. This is their national inheritance. Um, help them help us decide uh, how to manage them as they move forward, pay taxes, vote, uh, or help laws get made. Uh, those are all of our marching orders on how to let, manage our federal lands. And then finally, continue to collaborate with partners. Um, we are looking forward to actually having our own space to sort of greet visitors and plan from. But until that time, since uh, Paul was our acting superintendent day one on February 19th, 2015 to today. Um, we're acting like a virtual national park, uh, sharing other people's spaces, doing programs, events, youth engagement, um, and developing programs there. So what's the future hold for us? Well, we've done some things. Uh, we hope to do more, um, and we welcome your questions at the, the moderation session. Thank you. So you've heard a little bit about the national parks uh, that are part of the National Park Service. I'm going to talk about a program. So the National Park Service has over 50 different community assistance programs that are part of the same federal government agency that runs Indiana Dunes National Park. Uh, one of those is called Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance. That's the program I work for. And you're here today in the Great Cities Institute at UIC. My office is around the corner on the same floor in this same building. So. 
through a partnership agreement between the National Park Service and the University of Illinois at Chicago. There is a National Park Service employee that works out of UIC that uh, helps the staff at the Great Cities Institute fulfill their mission as well. So it's not just the National Park Service out there doing our mission, it's working in collaboration with other stakeholders and other organizations. Uh, you might be surprised to know that the mission of the National Park Service is two sentences. I think a lot of people think of the first sentence when they think of national parks, which is essentially, the Park Service will preserve unimpaired the natural and cultural resources of the country. Uh, they perhaps don't realize that the second sentence mandates us to cooperate with partners to extend the benefits of natural resource conservation and outdoor recreation throughout the country and indeed the world. So the National Park Service doesn't just think these things belong in national parks. We think they belong everywhere. And the program I work for is one of the many different uh, parts of the office that try to make that happen. Uh, I work for Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance. We are essentially a team of advisors across the country that provide planning assistance to local governments or community groups that are planning outdoor recreation or conservation projects in their own community. So I work for the National Park Service, my office is at UIC, and I work in projects in Illinois and Indiana that are not in national parks. That is a very unique and very entrepreneurial arrangement, uh, but it's working and we're doing it with cooperation for partners like UIC. Uh, essentially what we do is if local partners have an idea for a bike trail, or a water trail, or a new park, or a nature preserve, or how they can install wildlife habitat in their own communities, but they haven't quite figured out all the steps they need to take in order to make those things happen, they can request assistance from us and invite us to come in into their community and help them figure out how to come up with a plan to make that happen. So we can come in, uh, we like to say, uh, turning ideas into action. You know, a local group has a great idea, but maybe they don't have the staff time or the technical expertise, or they don't know all the groups they should be talking to. We can come in and walk them through that process and help them get a little bit closer. And where do we do this? Like I said, we do it uh, all over the country. I like showing this map and this image when I give these presentations because these are all the projects that RTCA has helped out with over about the last 10 years. So if there's the perception that the national parks are these great parks out west, I would argue differently. Every single one of those dots uh, represents some sort of investment from the National Park Service to improve recreation or conservation in a local community. Some of those are at park sites, but most of them are not. In fact, some of these are in places that you may have already been to. Uh, these might be in your neighborhood. The title of today's presentation is National Parks in Your Neighborhood. And it may not be Indiana Dunes or Glacier, but it's the National Park Service helping make your community a better place. Uh, just quick, we have one person in Alaska. If you take a look at all those dots right now. So they've got a lot of work, but they're doing a great job. It's a little bit easier for us in the Midwest we have nine people to cover 13 states. So, I'm sorry, we have 10 people. We just hired someone in Missouri. So we're a small program. We do what we can with the staff that we have. Um, but what if I can just kind of, if there's one lesson for my presentation today, it's that when you think of the National Park Service, I think a lot of us are default, you know, reactions to think of places like this. And like Paul said, this is a great place to go if you can make it someday. You know, a little bit closer to home, you might think of Indiana Dunes National Park. This is probably what it looks like right now or what it will look like in a few weeks. And you can get here on public transportation, which I think is the coolest part of Indiana Dunes and Pullman and our program as well. Uh, but I would challenge you to think of places like this. This is the Torrance Avenue Bridge over the Calumet River on the southeast side of Chicago. There's a little bit of land there that's owned by the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. And one of the projects I'm involved with is with the Metropolitan Planning Council, who two years ago launched a strategic initiative along with a couple other partners to make people re-envision their relationship with the river system in Chicago. And their goal is to make it more inviting, more productive, and more living. And this is one of the places they highlighted as saying, here's a wonderful amenity that someone could get on, interact with the river in their own community. And right now it's just kind of there. It's open to the public in the sense that you could drive there if you really wanted to, but there's really nothing there for you to do other than just walk down to the river. There's a little bit of a loop trail along uh, MWRD's uh, aeration station, but you know we come in and we help partners figure out you know what could go here, how could this be an amenity for the community, and MPC and some of their partners are hard at work at this, and we're honored to be a partner with that as well. 
Another example of a project I'm currently working on is in Summit, Illinois, which is on the, it's a suburb on the southwest uh, part of Cook County. And there, there's another piece of property also owned by MWRD. It's a three-acre boat launch site on the Chicago Sanitarium Ship Canal. And right now, the village is looking at leasing this property from MWRD and reopening the boat launch. It's already there, but it's vacant and not being utilized. Uh, and so if I am successful, and if this project is successful, in a couple years, if you were to go to this place and summit, the sign isn't going to say road ends, no fishing. Instead, you're going to find trailhead information and an interpretive sign telling a fourth grader what kind of fish live in the waterway that's just a few blocks from his house. And that's the type of difference that RTCA tries to make and how we partner with local organizations. <coughs> and then I'm going to finish with this slide because I like showing this at the end of my presentations because I think this really shows what the National Park Service is trying to do. And the text is a little small, but it says, there are some parks everyone should see someday, and if you, you could stop by this afternoon. And you heard from three different employees of the National Park Service who have given you some great examples of places you could go to this afternoon to interact with your National Park Service in some way. So thank you very much for coming. And with that, we're going to turn it over to some questions from Teresa on the Park Service and how we uh, interact with metropolitan communities. And then we should have some time for questions for you at the very end. So thank you. Fantastic. And I love the, the title, the National Parks in Your Neighborhood. So how does um, your park or program view its relationship with the Chicago metropolitan? Area. I think you gave us some idea, but if each of you can briefly say something about that. Never pass up a chance to go first. So most of the visitors that come to Indiana Dunes National Park are from Illinois, and a large percentage of those are from Chicago. So, um, you know, we have a really good connection. There's a, there's a lot of people in Chicago who know we're there and use the park frequently, but arguably more of, them, more of the folks here don't even know it's there. So um, it's been interesting, and I didn't realize this until I moved here, and I moved here from Minnesota. The, uh, the Illinois-Indiana line is a pretty significant boundary, <laughs> or uh, border crossing, I guess, suppose, and uh, short of the passport control, uh, it's not a seamless uh, conduit for business two ways. And so um, we get a lot of visitors from Chicago, but we are not really, until Pullman National Monument was created, the National Park Service had a very difficult time connecting to the city of Chicago. And strangely, the National Park Foundation, our philanthropic partner, who has raised a good bit of money for the Pullman uh, Visitor Center project, um, beyond having a couple board members who were very generous, had a, a tough time finishing up the job to raise that money. And so uh, we, we need to do a better job at um, connecting to the city of Chicago. Um, I, my answer is a one-word answer, fully integrated. You know, we see Pullman National Monument being a federal site, but we're also a very local site. So local that, you know, we have a relationship with our staff at our Shared Visitor Information Center with some of the kids who have felt comfortable enough to come in to ask to borrow our phone to reach out to social services. And so that's not necessarily something we train federal park staff to do, but we are, um, you know, a resource, uh, a safety net for some of the residents that live there in the community. Um, so it starts, you know, at, at that level. Uh, some of the temporary workers that work for the National Park are residents of the Pullman community right now. We have five residents um, actually employed. That's sort of shocking. Um, our acting superintendent, a project manager, and three interpreters um, actually live in the Pullman community. It's not a prerequisite to work there, um, but that's, uh, you know, so we're a jobs agency. Um, we had a youth uh, mentor from the HBCUI program this summer, funded from the Washington office, historically black colleges and universities, uh, Ms. Morgan Freeman, and she actually uh, lived in um, Chatham, so just north of the Pullman community. She's going uh, to Spelman in Atlanta, 
And so we're able to um, provide internships and we hope to do more of that. We were just at Haku this weekend um, working with um, young folks from around the country uh, of uh, uh, Hispanic uh, institutions um, looking for ways that we can partner and intern and just was talking with Mike about, you know, future opportunities to do that as well. And so, you know, sort of a jobs or awareness program. Um, and it's just a fun place to recreate. You know, I could put a blindfold on you, safely take you down to Pullman, um, drop you in the middle of this uh, historic residential red brick row house landscape, and you don't need to know anything once you take off the blindfold, but know that this place has some value and meaning. Something special happened there, and it makes you curious. You want to find out what's happening, and that's Chicago's story, the story of immigration, waves of immigration, migration, with the great migration from the south up to Chicago for jobs, um, industrialization, deindustrialization, um, race, um, gender, age, uh, what is the American dream? What does it mean to have opportunity? What is our role and responsibility to help others along the way? And so all of those stories and themes are part of why Pullman was set aside nationally as a place no, like no other in the country. Um, and all of those can help us here in Chicago locally and in the region um, to find out more about who we were, uh, to helpfully uh, make us better at deciding where we want to go together. So our program considers ourselves embedded in the local communities where we have field offices. Um, as I mentioned, our mandate means that we help uh, local partners do local projects. So uh, occasionally we will work with national park sites, but for the most part, the RTCA program exists to help local communities create local amenities uh, in their own communities. Uh, so we view ourselves as a resource that can help make communities better, uh, and particularly the communities that are outside of national parks. And, uh, that's how we kind of view our relationship, is we are a resource and a partner for local governments or local community groups. So, so let me turn to you for this next question. Let me turn to you first. Uh, in, in some ways, you've already started with this point, but in what ways did you, your part of a program integrate itself into the neighboring community? In contrast, what ways do you think it stands out as a separate entity? And I turn to you first. Um, because so much of it has gone on in Pullman in recent years with respect to community economic development, mm -hmm. um, mostly through the work of the, of the neighborhood uh, initiatives. And, um, and, and I know that a lot of their ability to sort of attract economic attention to the area has been because of, uh, and, and in fact, they worked on it, right? Building mm -hmm. up the, the Pullman and making possible the Pullman. Uh, monument. So, even to talk a little bit about that relationship and how the monument tied to community economic development in that area and in the North Pullman area. Uh, that's a great question. Paul can also uh, speak to that as well because he was part of that story. I think, you know, when friends like the National Parks and Conservation Association and our nonprofit partners and the state and the community said, please come, National Park Service, we want you here too to be part of the story, um, there was some thought that, you know, we would bring thousands and thousands of dollars in large bags and satchels of cash to benefit everybody um, and lots and lots of jobs. Now, quickly, both Paul and I, when we landed there, said jobs maybe. Maybe. Um, opportunity, yes. Bags of cash, no. But a benefit of the federal government is uh, using federal funds to leverage other funds as well. And that's the beauty of a partnership uh, area in terms of visitor services. Um, one of our partners, a nonprofit group, may be able to uh, compete for and, and successfully get funds to develop a program that the federal and state government couldn't. Or conversely, you know, the state government uh, might be right up the alley of a funding opportunity that um, can support and raise everybody else's values and missions together. Um, there was also some hope that the Park Service would be the catalyst, sort of this magic wand of gentrification and beautification that would happen. Um, but the people in the rooms really knew that they had to roll up their sleeves and it was a lot of hard work. I'd say probably 30 years of hard work. And the city of Chicago and their planning group has been heavy in the trenches, um, caring for and caring about that. The city uh, designated as the first uh, historic uh, neighborhood uh, on their register in the 1970s. Um, so the city has been um, caring for and caring about it for a long time. They're the first wave of defense if there's a historic structure that's part of the National Historic Landmark that um, is uh, threatened or potentially imperiled. 
they're the first regulatory group uh, with their permitting process to help evaluate that. Um, we have other groups like the Chicago Neighborhood Initiative. Um, they have brought groups like Walmart, uh, very contentious, um, but uh, negotiated uh, into the community because they listened to the community and uh, the community said we need um, fresh access to fresh produce and we also need um, shopping. Um, there was some con controversy in a Pullman community because Walmart is not a labor union represented organization. So um, we have lots of sidewalk conversations <laughs> amongst ourselves every day still about you know where we shop and where we spend our, our earning power. Um, they did put a green roof on that building. Um, just after the National Park was put uh, together there, um, they, the CNI negotiated and worked with Method Soap. So they are a San Francisco based company. Um, they were attracted to the residents and the community, some of the tax base and economic incentives from Chicago, uh, but also uh, the, the water from access from fresh water for the Great Lakes. It was the first south side light industry back into the Pullman community in about 50 years. And it's fun to think about, you know, cutting edge innovation from the Pullman train car plant from the 1880s to cutting edge uh, light industry in 2015. There they worked with a, um, a jobs benefit agreement um, with a percentage of jobs specifically targeted for the local community. Um, we will probably engage in conversations um, as things move forward. Um, our customers, our visitors, the tourists will need amenities, hotels, restaurants, tour buses will need sit down, um, you know, uh, food services, tire repair shops. Um, there's, uh, you know, a great deal of sort of peripheral economic incentives that the National Park Service has long proven to be uh, successful um, moving forward, but the challenge is always, you know, how can we have growth that's smart growth without displacing the citizens? And so we hope to be um, a, a continue or a, a, a at the conversation at the table, um, um, advocating and representing, um, the, trying to find the best needs for everybody. So that's a great example of public investment then also leading to some private uh, economic activity that then can benefit the entire community, particularly the communities at the table to do things like negotiate these job benefits and so on, and be employed in these places, have access to the goods and services and so on, and, and help even shape the vision of what goes forward. So that's a, um, that's a, that's a great example. And the Memphis plan is also non-toxic. Mm -hmm. right? yep. Green, they have a, um, the world's largest greenhouse, Gotham Greens was on their roof. They were so successful. A New York based company that they've now um, expanded their greenhouses to have a footprint on the ground. They have a wind turbine, um, solar panels in the parking lot, uh, bee apiary, and so they're really dedicated and committed to being, you know, a, a good green industry. Um, and it's a powerful story. Um, people from China, um, mid level managers and executives who are there, they come to Chicago and they specifically want to see both Pullman and Method. Um, the, the students in the high schools and the elementary schools also get that same experience of the comparison and contrast of how we as citizens make choices about jobs, industrialization, and balanced choices for quality of life. So it's, it's a story that we'll probably be talking about for forever. So if I buy method products, is some of that money that's staying <coughs> in the community? Uh, I think I'd have to ask them specifically. Did I dodge that one, Paul? That's good. Okay. That's good. But uh, Paul, what about in the, in the area around the dunes? There's all these little small communities there. Mm -hmm. What has been the relationship with the communities along the park and, and uh, particularly along this issue of it brings more activity, but what does it impact this place? Sure. Is it positive or what's going on? No, and so we've, been, we've had a 50 plus year head start and um, although arguably are just now starting to articulate our impact to the communities in this way. So here's the story I'll tell. Uh, I meet with the elect, we have 14 different political subdivisions in the three counties that Indiana Dunes lies in. And uh, so everything between Michigan City and Gary, um, we're working in Porter, LaPorte and Lake County, Indiana. So I meet with the elected officials as often as I can, and I will tell you that's almost a third of my job because of the way things change in elected offices, right? So Michigan City Mayor Ron Meir, good guy. Um, he's been in office since I've lived here. And uh, we meet a couple times a year and talk about what can the park do with the city and what can the city do with the park. And uh, I saw a light bulb finally go off for Ron last time we talked because 
some of the things we talked about became some of the talking points he uses now as he talks about Michigan City and there being the Eastern Gateway to the Indiana Dunes National Park. We have a new boat uh, operation in Michigan City that's, that uh, is an excursion boat that takes people out for about a one or two hour boat ride. They're basically along the coast of Indiana looking at the Indiana Dunes National Park. And it's, it just finished its second year. It's doing very well. Um, we put a ranger on that boat Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock for the family tour. And it's the most successful of all the week's boat rides. And the, and the operator wants to actually compensate us for the cost of that ranger, which is what we were hoping would happen. Uh, it's completely outside of the park, so there's no concession agreement and all, and so they don't have to deal with the government in that way, which is a wonderful thing for them and us. On the western side of the park, the city of Gary, uh, you know, whatever Gary, Indiana conjures up in your mind, uh, and, and I saw in the paper last week, one of the most miserable cities in America. What a horrible thing for somebody to write about a, a terrific place with some of the best public beaches on Lake Michigan. And our Douglas Center, uh, Paul Douglas Environmental Education Facilities in Gary, some beautiful dune and swale, wetland habitats, diverse oak savannas, just spectacular and a mile walk to the beaches in Gary, Indiana. Uh, they didn't talk about that. So the mayor-elect Jerome Prince, we met with Jerome, good guy. I, we have a lot of uh, hope for the city of Gary with some new leadership and talked about Gary being the western gateway to the Indiana Dunes National Park and all the, the um, hopefully value added that will bring. So I've started talking about Indiana Dunes National Park in a different way in the region than most park people will talk about a national park, although we're getting better at this. And coming out of the private sector, uh, we, are in the, we are in business of protecting America's natural and cultural treasures. And what is one of the largest industries in the United States, tourism. What is the largest product in that industry the country has? It's national parks. I will tell you that the National Park Service has one person in Washington who interfaces with that industry. And that, in my opinion, is a mistake. Because that industry is not an advocate for us as their primary product. Now, we can't lobby. We're federal employees. But our partners can. And if we had the, the tourism industry lobbying for support for the National Park Service, do you think we'd be doing better? I think we would be. So the Indiana Dunes story is this. The, the National Park operation at Indiana Dunes is about a $10 million a year company, local company. We employ about 100 full-time permanent employees, pretty good jobs in every job sector you could imagine from interpretive park rangers to civil engineers to law enforcement officers to accountants and budget people. Our $10 million operation coupled with about a million dollar operation for the Indiana Dunes State Park results in a half a billion dollars of economic activity in Northwest Indiana, probably Chicagoland. So let that sink in. That's a return of investment. I pay 11 million here and I get a half a billion there. Now, if your retirement fund was returning that kind of return, what would you be doing with your money? You'd be putting more money into that, right? Because that's unbelievable return. And the National Park Service is starting to talk about 10 to 20 to 1 returns on the public investment, which is way, way under the actual return. But we've never done the business analysis, so we don't use the argument. And, and Sue maybe will agree with me, our colleagues, who are great people, are biologists and historians and interpreters and, you know, we're hugging trees and cactus. We resent institutionally having to use a business argument to justify our existence. And so I'm a fisherman. There's the fish again. Stop. You fish what they're biting on. <laughs> you fish what they're biting on. Unless your idea of fishing is napping and not being disturbed. If you want to catch fish, you got to fish what they're biting on. So what, is, what do people bite on? What do elected officials bite on? Good business. So the national park system is good business for the United States of America. When Pullman National Monument is built out, built out with a visitor center and some community amenities from the private sector who see opportunity, I think it's going to knock people's socks off. 
that there's going to be a half a million to a million people a year from all over the world who visit Pullman National Monument. It's not a stretch given the number of people who visit the city for other reasons. And if you think about railroad themes, I call them foamers, the railroad foamers, people who just like, they got to go see that train thing, they're going to go to Pullman because Pullman has a global brand. And the Arrowhead, a global brand. So we're good business. So we talk about we're a half a billion dollar piece of business for the region. So we should be protected and taken care of. We are not out there in lieu of <coughs> development and economic development. We're part of the region's healthy economic mix. And people, business people are looking at me like, we've met with more developers since our names changed <coughs> who are proposing to invest money in Gary and Michigan City and want to make sure what they're doing is compatible with what, what we want to see. They want us on their side. And I've told them, get us involved early. We'll tell you what we think. And we would rather work with you than fight you. And we will fight you. But I much my day is a lot better spent being a better partner than a, an enemy. So that's, that's the story. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really, that's really great. The Pullman, the connection, you talked about Pullman. Summer of 2014, hot August night, big group of people in the state part of the building, the factory. Um, the director of the National Park Service, John Jarvis, gets up and says, Pullman National Monument will bring millions of dollars for jobs, transportation, and education to the south side of Chicago. And the crowd is roaring. And Alderman Tony Beal, good guy, I think he gets on the phone. He calls Rahm Emanuel and says, Ron, there's 600 people here. And 20 minutes later, the door kicks open, and a couple of policemen walk in, and Rahm Emanuel gets, comes into the building and says, Pullman National Monument will bring millions of dollars for jobs and roads and schools. And, blah, blah. and I'm sitting there, and I'm shaking Lynn McClure's shoulders from the National Park Conservation Association. This is great. I can't wait for this to start. Knowing that it will come, and it will not be the government that will do it. It will be the uh, entrepreneurs like Pullman who see the opportunity to make investments in a, in a good thing. And this brand will help that. So that was fun. Fun night, terrifying night. <laughs> it was great to be uh, in Pullman at that, at that time. But the brand set the stage for, Correct. for this end to follow. So um, I want to come back to one of the points you made about um, you don't always want to have to be in a position of making the economic development argument or the business argument. Um, uh, but before, uh, even though it's a very powerful and important argument, before I do that, I want to see, Mike, if you want to add anything on the economic activity and how rivers and trails maybe connect um, and reinforce it or somehow. Yeah, so one of the partners that uh, we often run across is a group called Trails for Illinois. I think they're still one of the major bike advocacy groups in Illinois. And they released a report a year or two ago that tried to, it looked at the economic impact of trail systems in the state of Illinois. And so they looked at a couple of regional trails throughout the entire state, one in the Chicago metro area, I think it was the Prairie Path, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I would say about a half dozen different trails. And what they found is that the average person who's on a bike on a weekend afternoon when the weather's nice spends about $54 as part of that day where they're out riding a trail. So $54, part of that might be they're gonna buy lunch somewhere, they're gonna grab a beer when they're done biking or in the middle of biking, or they're gonna park somewhere or they have to buy a new piece of equipment for the bike, but they're buying it from somewhere. And so if you're a restaurant or a bar or an ice cream shop or somewhere along that regional trail, you have a great opportunity to make a lot of money and sustain a small business just from recreational trail users. And so uh, that impact is not lost on the RTCA program. There's a model we like to share with partners called Trail Towns, which was model or it started in Ohio or Pennsylvania, I think, and then it slowly uh, migrated into Michigan and now you can find it all over the country. Uh, but the, it's an economic development model that basically says if someone's going on a long, you know, multi-day bike ride, they're stopping somewhere, they're eating somewhere, they're sleeping somewhere, why not have that be your small town? Why not let that be something that reinvigorates your main street? You know, draw people into your community because they're going out there anyway. People want to do this. One of the, this report cites a stat that says, uh, you know, regional trails are one of the number one amenities that people look for when they're purchasing a home. Uh, that begs the other question of, you know, they may not want the trail right in their backyard, but they want it kind of nearby. But 
So people think of these things as good things and part of their communities. And if you look at the 606 and what's going on right now with the Major Taylor Trail and the Cal Sag Trail, you can kind of see that you know, people want to have these in their community. And so uh, the type of small recreation or conservation amenities that RTCA can support play a role in that as well. You know, even though um, we, you know, you you want us to move away from just the image of the, the big Western parks, right? One of the things that's really key to the work and even part of the, the reason for the National Park Service in the beginning was to protect some of our very precious natural resources, right? And of course, we're hearing more and more research that talks about the relationship between time in nature, time with nature, and how it affects our health and so on. But so many of us, and especially young people, are worried about right, uh, big issues related to, to the climate. And so much of our ability to be able to remain uh, on this earth right, is related to our protection of the various ecosystems. So I'm wondering if uh, you all can address, each of you, um, especially related to, to, the, to the dune, but also related to the rivers, um, the relationship to um, you mentioned swales, for example, right? Of course, the dunes themselves, right, is is a, is is part of this really rich ecosystem, and and then we've got issues around water tables and and trees and you know the various kinds of habitat for various species, and so if you can talk a little bit about the importance of the parks in our neighborhoods as it relates to nature ecosystems and our natural health, and maybe you can start with. So I was at a, a conference over the summer where there were some groups talking about environmental advocacy with wildlife and uh, endangered migratory birds. And one of the panelists uh, said something to the effect of, you know, if, if a child has never had the experience with, uh, you know, a common bird in their community, you know, how are they going to care about or why are they going to care about endangered condors in California? Which really struck me because there are those very serious, very big picture global environmental questions. And I think one of the, the, the ways that you get people to, to buy in and care about that is they see something in their own community that relates to them. And that's where our program steps in, is that you know, we want people to be able to enjoy local parks and local green space that they see every single day. Because if they care about those places, they're going to care about Pullman and Indiana Dunes and the large environmental questions. So we try to come in and start small in communities. The National Park Service has kicked off a Healthy Parks, Healthy People initiative. And so um, many places, natural and suburban, but also urban, um, work with healthcare providers. Instead of your doctor writing a prescription for medication, um, we ask your doctor to write a prescription for get out and walk and get out on a trail. And so park staff are ready to sort of interface um, and start gently and then motivate people forward. You know, you think that, you know, that that's not for Pullman, but, but it really is for Pullman. You know, Pullman is sort of a safe landscape to some degree. It has, it's walkable, it's comfortable, there's some amenities there. Um, you'd be surprised at wildlife, you know, there's monks parakeets and bald eagles. Um, uh, there we participated with um, Lincoln Park Zoo in a bat study in an area, just trying to identify bats and sort of this interface of urban residential areas. Coyotes had a den in the factory grounds until, you know, for a little bit. So there's shocking amounts of resiliency of wildlife and that's a story in itself right there. Start small. Talk about the ants with young people, the raccoons, yes, the city rats or the squirrels. Um, talk about the resiliency and how they adapt and cope um, because we do see um, young adults, children, even adults um, that have significant trauma in their life, significant crisis. They've lost a loved one. They've exposed to um, terrorism or gangs, they you know they have some real economic uh, challenges or mental health challenges, and having these safe spaces like an urban park, a green space, a forest preserve, a park district, um, and somebody willing to connect them, make it safe, or be an ambassador um, can simply um, change their heart rate, reduce some of the trauma and stress. So that's you know that's priceless. So yeah, I mean the, 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 the one that's staring us right in the face is that we are on the edge of 20% of the globe's freshwater supply, the Great Lakes. And so um, what, what we take for granted every day is becoming one of the most precious commodities on the earth. And so as I travel around the region and I look at, because and, and, I'm a water resource 
guy at heart. Most of the tributaries that enter Lake Michigan are entering it brown. They're dirty. And the lake continues chugging away, beautiful blue, turquoise, green water. You know, I sent my brother in Philly a picture of the beach at Indiana Dunes. He thought I was in Mexico. And when I told him I was in Indiana, he said, ha, 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 no, really, where are you? And I said, I'm in Indiana. Look at your map. So we have to talk about this before we reach this point where the lake is no longer a clean source of fresh water. And if you don't think people have their eye on the Great Lakes, there's always, a, there's always talk about, you know, let's build a big pipeline and pipe it to Arizona or somewhere else. Um, so, and, and you know, I, I am not your tree-hugging environmentalist. I enjoy the modern conveniences that we all have. I might, you know, steel and electric power in my house. You know, I, I, I get that we have, we live in an industrial modern age. We have to though figure out ways to make those things and not kill us while they're making them. And so we've had a couple instances the last couple years in Indiana Dunes um, where, you know, accidents in industry have happened and the, the, the government, both the federal and state government, has not been in that much of a hurry to let us know what happened nor do anything about it. And it's a little terrifying. So again, I'm a, I'm a business guy, you know, I, I kind of get we, we have to have these things to continue enjoying this life we leave. But it was terrifying for me to learn that there is a drinking water standard for cyanide. Let that soak in. Oh, you're allowed to have 0.2 milligrams per liter in your drinking water, which is a, a level of cyanide that actually kills fish if they're immersed in water with that kind of, you know, the drinking water standard is toxic to fish. So I see dead catfish from a, a corporate spill and um, it's hard to kill a catfish. It's hard to kill a catfish. So I worry about that. And the, the news a year ago, uh, one of the mills is releasing 18,000 pounds of lead into the atmosphere a year. And people are aghast. And that's, what they're, that's actually less than their permit allows them to. That's the story. So who, who arrived at these numbers? Um, that, we have to figure this out. So there's, you know, we, we have the opportunity to talk about clean water issues and, and, you know, just the effects of living in a place that's heavily industrialized and what the cost to our natural resources, unimpaired for future generations, what that means. Um, the park prescription program is a great one. I was in the doctor's office yesterday and I asked my doctor, I said, hey, uh, we have this program called Park Prescriptions. And he said, oh, does the Park Service subsidize your prescription costs? I said, no, no. You, the physician, will see somebody come in and you will, you will write them a prescription to spend 30 minutes three times a week in the park for their health. And he really liked that. So I'm going to follow up with probably some information and maybe even a prescription pad. And then, uh, you know, when I see him again in four months, I'll ask him how that went. It's a cool idea. So we have a program called the Canoe Mobile. We have these big Voyager canoes and we put kids in them and we take them on short canoe trips in the local waterways. Lake Michigan, the Marquette Lagoons, Lake George and Hobart, Trail Creek in Michigan City. Today they're on the Kankakee River in Southern Porter and LaPorte counties. And we are connecting kids. We're giving them a transformational experience in out the outdoors. And many of these kids who are urban kids, suburban kids, even rural kids are not connected at all to nature. And we've, we've done this program now for uh, about a dozen years all over the country with a nonprofit in Minnesota called Wilderness Inquiry. And we now have six of these boats permanently located at Indiana Dunes National Park. And those boats will hopefully serve Milwaukee to Grand Rapids, Michigan, the whole southern basin of Lake Michigan. And our goal is to have 25,000 kids a year in that region in these canoes experiencing this. And it's not that they're going to learn what kind of birds they see. They're going to learn a little bit about clean water, but what they're going to learn is they're going to conquer a fear because let me tell you, nobody knows how to swim anymore, right? These kids are terrified. They don't know how to swim. I can't even fathom that. Well, I tell them it's a canoe program. It's not a swimming program. You have a vest on, you're not going to be swimming. And if, if it does go over, rarely, you're fine. But they're working as a team. They're conquering a fear. They're building self-confidence and it's been, studied early on that when these kids get out of these boats, 
they're laughing. They're the happiest they've ever been. They say, that's the best day of my life. And when they go back to school, their minds are open more to learning for a measurable period of time, just because of sunlight, fresh air, and nature. It's cheap, it's safe, and we should be doing more of it. And so we hope to bring that to kids in the region. And uh, we, we would love to do the empirical study that proves that it's good for you, but we're going to just assume that it is and keep doing it. We've done this program in 55 cities. These boats have been from New York City to San Francisco. They've been from Yellowstone National Park to Indiana Dunes National Park. Um, it's spectacular to watch. So um, we have a residential environmental education center at the Dunes National Park, the Dunes Learning Center. Every day, kids' lives are transformed there. And I'm saying this as a city kid who gets it. When I had my transformational moment in nature change my life, the kids we come across now don't even know that a job like this is an option. They don't even know. And so we're just giving them an experience, one of a million they'll have, so that they can make a better choice when they're an adult or getting to be an adult. And what I think we do at the Dunes Learning Center and Pullman National Monument and everything else we do, all the trails and river work that Mike does, is we're training better citizens for the future of this country. Because my contention is at the Dunes Learning Center that every kid that goes there is probably one less kid that we're feeding in prison. And that's a pretty bold claim with no science, but I'm gonna make it. <laughs> Prove me wrong. The burden of proof is on the accuser. So uh, I think we're training good citizens. And those kids may not be park rangers, but they're going to know about clean water issues and wildlife issues and you know, community health issues from the environmental perspective. That's where I think our value, we have not assigned that an economic value. And I think there is one. I just have to follow up with that question here, because I was at John Beat um, Visitor Center in New Orleans when two little kids were being um, sworn in. And it was the most precious thing. But what was most interesting was they had certain things that they had to uphold and was the music of jazz, which is New Orleans. <laughs> now I asked Sun Pai, Bruce Barnes, does that happen in every other um, national park? What, so do you have a specific thing that you say for Indiana or for Illinois that you have to uphold, like they say jazz? Everybody raise your right hand. <laughs> I promise to learn about. I promise to explore, and I promise to protect the Indiana Dunes National Park. Pullman National Monument. Pullman National Monument. And stop by, I'll give you your badge. <laughs> well, and that actually leads to, to a question I have, and then we'll open it up more fully. What, uh, first of all, I just don't want to forget, too, tonight at 5 o'clock, we have a program on water dis diplomacy. So we're co -part hmm. we're partnering with the Fresh Waters Lab, Rachel Haverlock, this awesome a uh, fellow with us and faculty member who does work on, on the Great Lakes and on water issues worldwide. So we're, ha we're having an event here at f from five to seven, it's called Water Diplomacy. But here's my, here's my question to you all again, then we'll open it up. What is it that, you kind of just answered it a little bit, but if we can get some more response on this, that we can do? What is it, because we know that there's some threat now even to the public, this very important public good and the tax and opening it up for, for, for its non-public use, right? Um, what is it that we can do? What would you like us to do? What do you see our role in the future of, of uh, supporting National Park Service? Want to go? Go, Paul. All right. I gave Sue a chance there, but she punted. Let's go. So here's what you can do. Um, be advocates. First of all, vote vote. We're a federal government agency. And so most of what we are directed to do via policy and law is comes out of the federal government. So make sure you get the right folks in the, in the office that, do, that share your values. So the other part of it is, and um, it's philanthropy. So we have a budget, and this is an interesting thing, like 98% of our operation is funded by the federal government giving us money. And of course, it's plenty said no one in the Park Service recently. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not enough. But it's real easy as a government employee to sit back and say, well, we'll do what we can with what we get. 
the, the, the paradigm is shifting to there's a lot of private money that's coming to help the, the national parks operate. I mentioned the Dunes Learning Center, a nonprofit, the Historic Pullman Foundation, and the Afelt Randolph Museum, nonprofits, and that the private sector, the public sector combined, we can do everything, anything and everything. But as government, we can only go so far. And that, that having an office here is a partnership that allows us to do more than if Michael were sitting in an office at either Pullman or Indiana Dunes National Park. Every day he's coming in contact with students and faculty and partners here that you wouldn't see in a federal office building because you have to go through a metal detector sometimes and get frisked and it's not much fun. You don't go to those meetings. I don't go to those meetings. So um, vote, contact your elected officials and be advocates and support uh, the public and private organizations that help do this work. Not just the National Park Service and our partners, but people like the Dunes Learning Center, the Historic Pullman Foundation. All these things, the, the leverage that that provides us is spectacular. But don't just sit around and hope that it'll be okay, because it's not. Our, my 31 years in government, the, uh, the buying power of the money that we get from the, the government, the graph looks like this. Over time, the buying power is decreasing. Indiana Dunes is 30% less the size it was staff-wise fit than it was 15 years ago. Now luckily, everything's easier and cheaper now so, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. So I don't know how we do what we do, given the, the three decades of budgets I've seen. So do you want to um, I support what Paul has shared, but I have another simple uh, thing that you can do. Fall in love. Just fall in love. Find your park. I can't tell you how many times people come to Pullman seeking, seeking fill in the blank, uh, trains, labor history, romantic Chicago, uh, a rest stop, their passport stamp, their junior ranger pass, and they have an experience there with us, with the resident, with one of the other partners in the community, and they leave going, I had no idea, fill in the blank. This is interesting, I wanna learn more. And I can say that that happens all over the country at all of the national park sites, whether it's Martin Luther King's home in Atlanta, or um, you know the Rocky Mountains, or uh, the Statue of Liberty. Find your park, fall in love with it. And not just a national park, your green space, your local um, community park, your forest preserves, you know the city of Chicago and its surrounding area. Thank goodness folks 100 years ago had the foresight um, to set aside some lands and decades and decades of stewards before us have stepped in and served and given and supported. Step into that parade, step into that stream and find what you love and, and grow life into it. If we all do a little bit of that, it's amazing what we can accomplish together. So I would say the like Sue said, you know, find the place you love. I would say find the place you care about and then find the other people out there that care about it as well. Because I've never gotten involved in a conservation project where they were starting from scratch. You know, there are always people there who are organizing, who are thinking about what comes next, who are trying to find a plan, who are trying to find funding. So if you really care about something and you wanna see a change happen, I'm guessing there are other people out there too. And sometimes it just takes enough people to keep showing up and talk to the right partners and talk to the right stakeholder organizations. You'd be surprised how many groups and organizations and public agencies are out there that have some kind of stake in what you want to see in your community. And you'd be surprised how many organizations would like to help or at least play a small role. You know, I never go into a project where I talk to partners and say, you know, the National Park Service is going to solve this problem for you. Because I can't, and the honest truth is, you know, I don't need to because the Chicago Park District is doing wonderful things with their natural areas program. The Forest Preserve District of Cook County is doing wonderful things with some of their river and river access sites and some of the green spaces they have. And, and they have 70,000 acres in Cook County. They're the largest landowner, I believe, in the county is the Forest Preserve District. 70,000 acres, and I'd be because the Cook County Forest Preserve, because I noticed Paul has 15,000 acres, which is commendable, but, they, but the Forest Preserve District of Cook County has 69,870 or something like that. Well, they were looking at cities, large cities, and how many acres of green area they have. And of course, living in Chicago, 
from the Chicago Park District and the Cook County Forest Preserve, you know, I thought we'd have to be right up in the top, and we weren't. But they did not take the Forest Preserve into account. They only looked at the Chicago Park District. Oh. So the places you care about, you know, there's someone like Chelsea with Friends of the River that cares about it as well. So go find her afterwards, and you can talk about what you can do. Any questions, any more questions or comments from you all? We have a, we have, we have a few more, more minutes. Go ahead, Mr. I'm a former um, history teacher in Chicago Public School. So when I heard about the Pullman Monument, I was so excited because Pullman and everything around him, Pullman quarters, the strikes, everything, are so important to the history of our city and the history of our country, and I thought, Finally, there's going to be a repository, a place where you can have hundreds of people can go and they can learn about this. And um, for reasons that we don't want to discuss, I got a little bit worried in the last election when anything that was done by the former president, we had to get rid of it. And so I'm wondering if there's... The, the beauty is the Pullman story has been the Pullman story for 140 years. We're just the most recent caretakers and storytellers joining other fabulous partners uh, with a different perspective and a different voice. Um, and so, you know, the exciting part is we have third, fourth, and sixth grade curriculum. Um, we've been working closely with the schools within the National Monument and within a three mile radius of the National Monument, uh, trying to give them, you know, uh, a real connection because they live and move through this historic community. Uh, but our partners have been working with some of the educators and the history yeah, communities. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. As they learned today, that the National Park has a lot of interesting resources. So my question is from Michael: that uh, whether the National Park Park started targeting the GIS, 2D GIS, and 3D GIS, or the Web GIS technology? for disseminating all this information to the public domain. Mm -hmm. GIS. For, for GIS. Uh, so we use it a little bit for some of our internal project planning, uh, but most things what I do are, are project specific. So um, we like to look at things from a comprehensive and connectivity issue, but how I would use GIS would be very specific to an individual site specific project. Um, it would be nice though if I could maintain a GIS database of everything I do. But we have, so that image I showed up on the, the screen of all the projects, so that's, that's I think on the internet, you can find out where those are. Uh, but that would be about it for how I use it. No, we have a substantial GIS database for the Indiana Dunes National Park and, and with mostly resource management and fire management, um, you know, it's, it's uh, again, it's one of those tools that, and if you're a tool person, you never have enough tools. And, um, and we, we barely can fully exploit all the advantages of the tools that we have. So the Park Service is 103 years old, and we are not known as the, uh, the, the um, embracers of new technology. I'll say it that way. And so we are, uh, we are just now figuring out social media. Figure that one out. Bill, go ahead and then um, the, Your predecessor died in Panda, I assume that she was your predecessor. Correct, yep. Uh, was very much involved, as was the Park Service, in the, the formation of the CalSag mm -hmm. Trail. Probably know that. Uh, my question is, are you still involved with the CalSag Trail, and if so, or if you know what's the what's likely what's going on with the, the other half that's a proper path to deal with yeah. uh, well i know they're building some of it i think the area around whistler woods the trail is coming in or it's it was at over the one point over the summer uh no i don't know what the current status of that is uh each staff person in our program manages their own project portfolio so uh the cal sag was never one of mine but it could be the, the Trail runs basically from the lawn eventually over to the Indiana border, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, and it's fully complete up to Blue Island, I believe. Um, and then the other part that goes through some pretty built up and industrial area is tougher. 
and some communities that have not much money to be able to contribute to it. Yeah, it's uh, the Cal State is one of the big ones right now, but we can talk afterwards if you want to, if you think there might be a need. Yes, over here. Suma thought that I would have a question for her. <laughs> we can and talk I, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I know we do. Uh, but it just occurred to me, and Paul almost touched on it, one of the things in Pullman that we're waiting to happen, and maybe you can give us an update if there's anything happening, is uh, the fact that we don't have any Pullman cars in Pullman. And what we really need are some Pullman cars, the actual rail cars. On display. They're working on it. So the acting park superintendent, project manager for the National Park Service, as well as the site superintendent for IDNR and some of the state, uh, Springfield State employees, uh, along with a couple um, nonprofit volunteers, are actively looking for some rolling stock or some train equipment. Um, the key is, you know, receiving it and being able to maintain it. And so. Uh, they are working the process. You know, we're, you know, everybody has a desire to try and have uh, some train equipment there in time for uh, when the grounds are ready. Um, so uh, that's we're optimistic. If you have any inside lines, though, please let us know. Anybody? I'm sure you must have exhibits too on the Pullman Porters. We do. We do. Uh, we have some com companion exhibits. Of course, we have the National A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porter Museum that you know specifically um, curates that story, but we will also talk about it. Um, where our visitor center is sort of going to be an introduction to the themes. You know, we've sort of crafted maybe a half an hour experience with our exhibits. Uh, maybe you want to purchase something in our companion bookstore and then get out. Get out of our space. Uh, take a program. Go see our partners in the state. Go see our partners with the other uh, inst uh, the other tours, the other programs, the other activities. We'll help you sort of find what you're interested in um, and then help you match that to other experiences. There will be some real diverse ones. There's a very interesting um, arts vibe in the Pullman community. Uh, historic gardens, native gardens. I mean, um, there's some fantastic uh, things that aren't a federal state thing, but a quality of life thing from community residents. And we only um, see it continue to attract more interesting folks. Uh, one thing I wanted to share is the Calumet Voices National Stories exhibits running through November there at our partner visitor center. Uh, the Field Museum and um, Arsler Middle funded it, and uh, it was uh, to act as if we're a Calumet National Heritage Area. So they said, let's create some exhibits, let's have it travel. So it's starting with us in Pullman, it moves to the Gary Public Library after Christmas, then it goes to Valparaiso University at the Brower Museum, and the same skin of the exhibit will change with the community historic groups adding different artifacts and objects to think about us as a society, immigration, industrialization, land management, advocacy, those are some of the themes that float throughout. And then in the end of the second year, many of the objects at the traveling exhibit show back up at the Field Museum. And so, you know, that's not our project, it's not their project, it's, it's everybody's project together. And that's part of uh, another collaborative, the, the Calumet National Heritage Area. Yes. Initiative. I have a question for Paul. What neighborhood is the way out of the Taconi neighborhood. Okay. Where are you Paulsburg, from? Paulsburg. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, last question. Um, I'm just curious about land acquisition and um, are you actively looking for more land in these urban areas that you work with? And second, do you have uh, advisory boards for each? of your um, institutions? So I can talk about the dunes. You know, we have, the dunes boundary is pretty much filled out. There are some opportunities adjacent to the boundary that we, we and some partners keep looking at. We don't have a budget line for land acquisition. Um, federal land acquisition is a, is a hot button topic uh, with uh, some folks, um, but we are opportunistic either directly with the federal government or through partners. Uh, we do have nonprofit partner groups. We have a, a wealth of them at Indiana Dunes. I mentioned the Dunes Learning Center. There's a Save the Dunes Council. There's a Shirley Hines Land Trust. There's a Friends of Indiana Dunes. There's a Dunes National Park Association. There's the National Parks and Conservation Association. So there's a lot of uh, NGO, private nonprofit interest in different niches helping us do various things. 
And as far as Pullman is, um, right now we're really just interested in the clock tower building. While the boundary is larger and the federal government could have authority to acquire other properties, we have no initiative, no priority list at this time, no funding, um, no staffing to support that. Instead, conversely, we would rather have the existing property owners continue to maintain it and improve it and look for strategies and collaboration to help the landowners, whether they're private property, industrial property, or public spaces, um, um, be able to better take care of them and provide general public value just for aesthetic reasons. That being said, you know, some really significant terminally unique buildings that helped define it is the National Historic Landmark District in the 1970s. If one of those uh, properties or structures were failing, if the community, if the property owner came knocking on our door and asked for help, then we do have a fairly rigorous evaluation process um, to see if, if there's something we can do to support them or if we want to receive ownership. But um, those are hopefully many years out for future <laughs> managers beyond my life cycle there. Did you want to say more about that? Yeah, I don't know if that really applies to our program, but a lot of those, those boards or stakeholder groups you alluded to are quite frequently the partners I work with. So. So two or three things before we wrap up, and, um, and you have a chance to talk about Philadelphia with, with Paul. <clears throat> One of which is, I want to call your attention that in 2016, in April, there was a National Geographic um, article on parks and bringing nature close to home. And in that article, Paul was quoted. And one of the things that he uh, talked about, and, and, and I think has been a conversation with, with, with you all, is how also to reach more diverse audiences, right? So I think with more time, we would have talked a little bit more about the extent to which we're really expanding who it is that goes to and utilizes the parks. Um, I think there's a lot more we could have said uh, about that. Um, secondly, I want to make sure that we acknowledge that the previous and still ongoing stewards of our land um, the native, the indigenous people who were here prior to our coming. Um, and even to acknowledge, for example, that the uh, diagonals through our very well-constructed grid in Chicago were actually indigenous trails. Um, and how key the indigenous people were to really uh, informing right, some of the early settlers of Chicago that how to live um, in relationship to our waterways and to our nature including even the use of the portages. So I didn't want to go and say something about acknowledging that. And then thirdly, you all brought props, um, but I think we should have them put them on, right? Don't you think we want to see them put their hats on? Come on now, Sue and Paul, let's see your hats. It's a policy violation. Yeah, we're, we're indoors, but. Oh yeah, there we go, yeah, all right. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. You're a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for coming. If you have time, come back at five and join us. Thanks again to Can TV. We love you. Um, and again, we appreciate your being here. Thank you. I think there's still some more pizza. And